Good morning. We begin in our book, Disciplines of a Godly Man by R. Kent Hughes. We are in chapter one, which is entitled Disciplines for Godliness. And the author has a heading here called Why the Disciplines? So let's begin reading. Understanding this, we now get down to the reasons for this book, which are two. First, in today's world and church, disciplined Christian lives are the exception, not the rule. This goes for men, women, and the professional clergy. We cannot excuse ourselves by saying this has always been the case. It has not. As to why this is so, several common sense reasons could be tendered, such as poor teaching or individual sloth. But underlying much of the conscious rejection of spiritual discipline is the fear of legalism. For many, spiritual discipline means putting oneself back under the law with a series of draconian rules which no one can live up to and which spawn frustration and spiritual death. But nothing could be further from the truth if you understand what discipline and legalism are. The difference is one of motivation. Legalism is self-centered. Discipline is God-centered. The legalistic heart says, I will do this thing to gain merit with God. The disciplined heart says, I will do this thing because I love God and want to please him. There is an infinite difference between the motivation of legalism and discipline. Paul knew this implicitly and fought the legalists bare-knuckled all the way across Asia Minor, never giving an inch. And now he shouts to us, train or discipline yourself to be godly. If we confuse legalism and discipline, we do so to our own soul's peril. The second reason for this book is that men are so much less spiritually inclined and spiritually disciplined than women. A recent study conducted in the United Methodist Church reveals that 85% of the subscribers to that denomination's premier devotional booklet, The Upper Room, are women. Moreover, the same statistics hold true for the other devotional booklet, Alive Now, which has a 75% female readership. This is corroborated by the fact that the overwhelming majority of books purchased in Christian bookstores are bought by women. Women simply read more Christian literature. It is also true that far more women are concerned about the spiritual welfare of their mates than vice versa. The magazine Today's Christian Women has found that articles focusing on the spiritual development of husbands have been garnered the highest readership. All this is sustained by hard statistics. A Gallup poll conducted in June 1990 revealed that 71% of the women surveyed believed religion can answer today's problems, while only 55% of the men agreed. The typical church service has 59% females versus 41% male attenders. Furthermore, married women who attend churches without their husbands outnumbered them by four to one the men attending without their wives. Why? Certainly the pervasive American male credo of self-sufficiency and individualism contributes. Some of this may also be due to the male avoidance of anything relational, which of course Christianity is. But we do not concede that women are simply more spiritual by nature, the parade of great saints, male and female, down through the centuries, as well as the spiritually exemplary men in some of our churches today, clearly refutes this idea. But the fact remains that men today need far more help in building spiritual discipline than women. Men, what, am I, what I'm going to say in this book comes straight from the heart and my long study of God's word. Man to man, in writing this, I have imagined my own grown son sitting across the table, coffee cups in hand, as I try to impart to them what I think about the essential disciplines of godliness. This book is eminently user-friendly. The church in America needs real men. 
and we are the men. Cosmic Call We cannot overemphasize the importance of this call to spiritual discipline. Listen to Paul again from 1 Timothy 4, 7, and 8. Train yourself to be godly, for physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. Whether or not we have disciplined ourselves will make a huge difference in this life. We are all members of one another, and we are each either elevated or depressed by the inner lives of one another. Some of us affect others like a joyous tide lifting them upward, but some of us like undertoes to the body of Christ. If you are married, the presence or lack of spiritual discipline can serve to sanctify or damn your children and grandchildren. Spiritual discipline, therefore, holds huge promise for this present life. As for the life to come, spiritual discipline builds the enduring architecture of one's soul on the foundation of Christ, gold, silver, and precious stones, which will survive the fires of judgment and remain a monument to Christ for eternity. He is pulling this from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 15. Let me read that to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning in verse 10. It says, Because of God's grace to me, I have laid the foundation like an expert builder. Now others are building on it. But whoever is building on this foundation must be very careful. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, Jesus Christ. Anyone who builds on that foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw. But on the judgment day, Fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. But if that work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through the wall of flames. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 15. Some may minimize the importance of spiritual discipline now, but no one will then. Godliness has value for all things. The disciplined Christian gives and gets the best of both worlds, the world now and the world to come. The word discipline may raise the feeling of stultifying constraint in some minds, suggesting a claustrophobic, restricted life. Nothing could be farther from the truth. The obsessive, almost manic discipline of Mike Singletary liberates him to play like a wild man on the football field. Hemingway's angst over the right word freed him to leave a mark on the English language second only to Shakespeare. The billion sketches of the Renaissance greats set Michelangelo free to create the skies of the Sistine Chapel. The disciplined drudgery of the musical greats released their genius. And brothers in Christ, spiritual discipline frees us from the gravity of this present age and allows us to soar with the saints and angels. Let me say that again. Brothers in Christ, spiritual discipline frees us from the gravity of this present age and allows us to soar with the saints and angels. Do we have the sweat in us? Will we enter the gymnasium of divine discipline? Will we strip away the things that hold us back? Will we discipline ourselves through the power of the Holy Spirit? I invite you into God's gym in the following chapters. To some sanctifying sweat, to some pain and great gain, God is looking for a few good men. Food for thought. No manliness, no maturity. No discipline, no discipleship. No sweat, no sainthood. True or not true? How do you feel deep inside about this challenge? How does spiritual discipline differ from legalism? Which do you most often practice? 
Is the change needed? If so, how can you bring this about? Men, again, I thank you so much for being with me this morning in this book. We're getting very close to chapter 2, where we begin talking about relationships. In fact, the next discipline that we're going to be talking about is the discipline of purity. So I pray that you'll continue on with me in this book um, as we get into relationships. Thank you, and God bless.